<coughs> Hello, this is Gareth from the I Meet team. It is my great, awesomeness pleasure to introduce Sarah Ashley to talk about peer reviews by hook or by crook. Uh, and I want to take this opportunity to thank you for your time and putting together this wonderful, what I'm sure is going to be a wonderful presentation. I know how much goes into it. Over to you. Thank you so much, Gareth. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining me this uh, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, whatever your time zone is. Uh, I appreciate your attending. Uh, so let me first ask, how many of you have ever used the workshop activity? Um, can you give me a yes, no? Oh, I have two new... Oh, everybody's new. Awesome. That is wonderful. So I can um, tell you all about it and hopefully you're going to leave being superheroes of using the workshop activity. Well, the workshop activity allows you to do so many different things in terms of collaborating with students, um, students working with each other in groups on uh, reviewing each other, giving themselves feedback. You can also allow it to do self-reviews. So the student can review themselves on the work that they've done, and they can also review other people. The teachers in the course can also assess students, give them review and feedback. And you can override permissions for non-editing teacher role to also be able to give feedback. So it is a great tool for giving feedback, and you can use different ways to grade the, uh, either the submission or the feedback portion of it. And uh, you can use a rubric or you can use some other kind of uh, calculation that you can set up, okay? At the end of it, you'll see grades that are distributed for the students given a submission and then a grade for reviewing somebody else. You can use either or, or you can even say no grades at all and just make it a practice thing you would have a report at the end. You can see it on screen, but unfortunately you can't actually download it. So um, my presentation here today is gonna to show you different things that I came across, um, different issues that I came across, problems, challenges that I came across when implementing the workshop activity for our medical school to do their peer reviews and how I went around it to enable them to do the peer review by the end of the, of the semester. Okay, so let's move on here. A little bit about me, a little background. Um, I worked for Rutgers University for over four years now, just under five years. And it used to be University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. Um, then the, the state of New Jersey began to restructure the colleges, grouping some of them together, merging them here and there. And so UMDNJ got merged with Rutgers University. So now I work with Rutgers. I've been modeling for over nine years since 2007, um, starting with Moodle 1.7 or 8, I think, 1.8. And loving Moodle still crazy about it and not giving in to all these other LMSs that are trying to take over the world. Yes, <laughs> um, my background is computer science. I have a bachelor's and a master's in computer science and then I moved into instructional technology. So uh, right now I'm working with all of these different tools. I understand what's going on in the background of Moodle. Um, you know, uh, looking at code and installing plugins and doing all that fun stuff in the back end. And I also am able to deal with the front end, working with the teachers and the users, um, the students who uh, are using the product. So when they say, I wanted to jump around and turn around in a circle, I know what to tell the programmers. This is what you can do to make Moodle jump around and lie down and play nice. <laughs> so that's a really cool um, position that I have. When I'm not moodling, I am loving my two-year-old son, who's almost two and a half. Uh, being a mom is a, a new experience for me every day. He's teaching me something new. And my husband is a minister in the United Methodist Church, so I do a lot of church work for him as well, helping to get the newsletter out, helping to uh, create the PowerPoint for the sermon, running the technology for the sermon, uh, 
putting up videos, recording the sermon, putting up the videos, managing the website, all that tech support stuff, I do that. And then um, I love to sing and also play the drums. So I play the drum for my praise team um, whenever I get the chance. Now that I'm a mom, it's a little more difficult to do that. But those are some of the things that I love to do. So peer reviews for this particular activity. I had 180 medical students that were going to be grouped into groups of six. And so that was uh, about 30 groups or more. Um, sometimes they had like five people instead of six. So grouped activity. And they were going to do this in three phases. There were going to be three peer review activities in the course throughout the semester. The first was going to be covering musculoskeletal topics, and then cardiovascular, and then the third was pulmonary things, okay? So uh, they were learning to do oral case presentations. So if they uh, were, imagine themselves having a patient and then they present the patients to, you know, the group of uh, other doctors, right? They'd say, this is patient X, he came to the hospital with blah, 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 blah. You know, he's feeling like this, and this is what we're recommending. We think it's this and that. So they're practicing this kind of presentation. So what they wanted the students to do was half of them would record their, themselves doing this oral history, upload it into Moodle, and then have their group members critique it. And then the other half would do a live presentation in class. And so then they would have their computers and then go to the feedback um, form and then fill it in and give their feedback. Then in the next uh, activity, they would reverse. Those who presented live will now do uploads. And then those who uploaded will do a live presentation so that they all get a feel of um, both sides of the activity and then repeat. So this was what they were expected. Now, here are the requirements that they had or conditions. Some of the things were kind of written in stone and they couldn't make any change to it because this is what the curriculum required in the medical school. Late submissions must be allowed because students are busy. They have all these different rotations and clinical things to do. And so if they're late, they still have to be able to upload their work. So, of course, you know, like in the assignment Dropbox tool, um, you can allow late submissions. So the workshop allows that, allow late submissions. Also, um, they wanted it to be that submissions are not actually required because if you are presenting live in front of the class, then you have nothing to upload into the system, right? So, but you should still be able to be reviewed or critiqued. So there should be able to be a feedback form for somebody who has not submitted anything. Okay. Another requirement was that the advisors, who are the teachers, should all be able to also give feedback to the students. So that's fine. Some of the, some of the teachers were in as editing teachers, and some of them had the non-editing teacher role. The assessment score must be a simple average. And the assessment score is like if you put up a rubric and you say um, content, Okay, you have one, two, three, four, five, and then you select five. Um, eye contact, you have one, two, three, four, five, and then select two. All the different criteria in the rubric, when you get the score, it should be an average of the score. So that's what they wanted. The rubric levels do not actually start from zero. So it was not a zero, one, two, three, four, five scale. They had it starting from 60. 70, 80, 90, 100. There was no zeros. Okay. The final grade at the end of everything should be a simple average, which means that when you have a um, all the different gr group members, so you have five different people reviewing you plus the teacher, all those scores should be averaged together to give you a final score for the entire activity. That you can do. They wanted to be able to download reports at the end of the activity to Excel so that they can do some statistical analysis. And then they wanted to be able to save the workshop and use it again in another course. This particular implementation was for freshmen. So when they go into the next year and they begin uh, the course in the next year, they, it's the same students in the same groups with the same professors. So we can back up the 
the workshop and upload it into the new course and then still make use of the same um, settings. So that's useful. Moodle can do that. So I said, yes, 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 we can do all this. This is great. Good. So, you know, you know how to add an activity to Moodle. Add an activity, select workshop, put in the title, um, and then you put in date when it should open, date when it should close, all that kind of fun stuff. After you've hit save, this is the screen you get. And what I noticed immediately was that, okay, this is the student in the middle. On the left you have, or you should have, the person who is reviews, reviewing the student in the middle. And then on the right, you would see the person that the student is reviewing. Okay, so reviewed by on the left and reviewing somebody else on the right. There's no submission. You see, it says no submission found for this user. Let me zoom in here, maybe you can see it better. If you look at my test um, account here, it says no submission found for this user. So, um, it means nobody can review me because I have no submission. Though there, there needed to be a way to create a default submission so that those who are not uploading anything can still be reviewed. So I found out quickly that I needed to map out how this whole thing should happen from beginning to end and the different uh, solutions I needed to come up with um, when I come into Roblox. So let's take a look at some of these things. You know, when you're planning your road trip, you say, okay, um, red pin is where we're gonna stop first for gas. At the green, we're gonna stop and, um, and look at the sites. At the yellow, we're gonna stop there for gas or get food. So I had to map out, you know, the different things that would happen at each stage. And here is what it looks like for the workshop activity. These are the different phases of the workshop. You have a setup phase, which is when you create it, you, t you put in instructions for what the students should do. Um, you put in the start date for submission, the end date for submission. You put in a start date for when they can assess, that is when they can begin to critique each other and when that should end. You have, um, you can put in examples of a good submission, examples of a good feedback and things like that. So this is a setup phase. Right in the setup phase, I found out that at this point, I needed to add in default submissions and I needed to find a way to do that because the workshop does not immediately have it out of the box. In the submission phase, this is when the students who are recording their presentation on video can upload it. And we were using Kaltura as our video tool. And so the students would upload their video into Kaltura and then use the editor to insert the video into the editor, they embed the video. So that was easy enough to do. Um, when the submission phase is over, I had to check and see who was late, who hadn't yet submitted anything, and then help them to get their submission in. Also, I needed to make it possible for the non-editing teacher to assess because only teachers were able to do an assessment. So override the permission to allow non-editing teacher to assess. Okay, so that's possible, easy enough. Assessment phase, this is when they go in and then select you know, their feedback and then put in a comment. You did a great job, blah, blah, blah. So those who did, did the upload, they get critiqued first and then when they have the live presentations in class those who have not yet been critiqued get their assessments done at that point wonderful when that phase ended we go into the grading phase and at this point i have to make sure that the scores are all straight averages remember that the condition was that it has to be an average so a plus b plus c plus d divided by the number of different you know items that was not a straightforward thing. So I had to actually update the database with uh, manually computed averages, okay? So I'll show you what I did in order to um, get that going. Then when you're done, you close the workshop and when you close it, that is when the students can see their scores and then the feedback that they got. And then at this point, the department wants to be able to download reports and then do their statistics. So, setup phase. As I said, I found that we cannot have default submissions in the workshop. 
So I needed to come up with a solution to do that. So warning, I'm going to tell you right away that there's um, code coming ahead. My unique position as having a coding background and then also front-end training um, makes it possible for me to be able to implement these solutions. But what I want you to know is that there is a way to overcome these challenges. So if you as a, an individual are not able to implement these solutions, you can go to your IT department and say, okay, we need the workshop tool to be able to do this and that and the other. Here is the solution that has been presented. Can you please make it work? And then they will you know, do the coding thing for you. Just know that it is possible to do it. So go and do it. And then Carrie, I know you do your own stuff. So maybe you can contact me, I can help you, you know, implement some of these things too. So um, you need some tools in order to do this. Uh, you need to be able to access the database and the Moodle AdMiner plugin is a great tool that allows you to look at the tables in your database right from within Moodle. So you don't go need to sign into Google, uh, not Google, but godaddy.com and look at your server, go into PHP MyAdmin. You can do it right from Moodle if you use the Moodle AdMiner. And then the Configurable Reports um, plugin allows you to create quick reports. Sometimes you do not need even to use SQL code at all. You can just drag and drop. You can just um, select from a drop-down menu what you want, and then it builds the report for you. So I use Configurable Reports to create the um, custom reports that they wanted to download to Excel. Okay. And then, of course, you need administrator access to your Moodle site in order to install plugins, in order to get to the database, and then do some of these, these um, activities. Okay. Once you install the Moodle AdMiner, you can get to it from site admin and then the server, server selection, and then you click on Moodle AdMiner. And then reports, the configurable reports, once you install it, it's a block. And so, of course, you add the blocks to your course, and then you can see your list of um, reports as you create them. Easy to click on and find them. And you can manage your reports by clicking Manage Reports. And then you can add new reports, copy an existing report, and so on and so forth. First, roadblock, creating the default submissions. What I needed to do was um, the query that I needed to run in the database required the student IDs. You know that when you log into Moodle and you look at your um, profile page, in the URL you can see your user ID. There's an ID number there. That ID number, I needed that for every student in the course so that I could um, create a query that would up, uh, insert a submission into the workshop for everybody automatically. Once I build a query, then I can run it in AdMiner and then update the database. Okay. If you go to the course for this presentation, I have the detailed um, steps there and I have the code actually also there on the course page. So you can go take a look if you want to. I do want to explain what you will see on the course page. So I'm going to just display a little bit of code and show you what the, um, the code means and what you, what what you need to customize when you actually take the code for yourself. Okay. This is what it looks like. If you are going to run this to insert a submission into the database, you're inserting into a specific table. And one thing that you need to customize in this is highlighted in red there, MDL. That is the prefix of the workshop of the table. Is there a simulate mode in AdMiner? Hmm. I do not know. I'll check on that, Guido. I have not heard of a simulate mode. What 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 do you what do you think that the simulate mode um, should enable us to do? Can you just share briefly or elaborate on your question, please? Not really change the database. Oh. Hmm. I don't know. I'll, I'll check on that and post in the in the course, okay? Okay, so the MDL prefix is what it is in my, in my Moodle. Our databases, all the tables begin with Moodle, MDL underscore. In yours, it may be different. Maybe you customized it to say um, MDL TMT or train my trainer. 
right? Um, so whatever your, your database uh, prefix is, you have to make sure that you change it over here. The workshop ID, this is the workshop ID number. So it was the first workshop created on the course on, in Moodle. So the ID number for it was one. So whatever your workshop is, there might be a SQL way of inserting without actually committing. Huh, how interesting. I have to, what, what does that mean, not committing? Not altering the database? What does committing mean? That, that there, there is something that I'm not, oh. But don't you want it to save it? Because we want it to record that they have a, that they have a, a submission. Can you turn on your mic and please tell us a little more? Yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, I think uh, Guido is getting at um, double because because uh, insert is such a dangerous command that you want to right. check that you've got everything and the values are correct. Mm -hmm. So you really want a way of proving that the SQL is syntactically correct before you mm -hmm. actually change the database. Mm -hmm. So a commit is a RDMS thing, so relational database management system, where it actually does the whole process of doing it, but it doesn't actually then physically commit the transaction to the database to make it permanent. Okay, so kind of a preview. Um, <clears throat> almost. Yeah, almost of, is this all correct? Will this work? Yes or no, will this work in the way I expect it? But if it didn't work in the way I expected, it would be very bad for your database. Right. But, okay, so, of course, I did this. I didn't do this on production um, straight away. Uh, I didn't even do it on our test server straight away. I did it on my personal to check it out and then test it on, the, uh, on our testing server that is a copy of production to check it out. And then when my boss said, okay, let's go, then um, I did that. So yeah, absolutely. You you can't just go do this on production, of course. So you you should test it out and try it out first. But I understand that is great. Um, so once it it does work and as expected, can you then say yes? Do it. Is is that is that a uh huh? A backup before the submission. Absolutely, definitely. Thank you so much. Yes. Definitely steps that you have to take, yes. So uh, yeah, back up and then, so that you have a snapshot of what the, the status of the database before you do it, and then um, you insert, okay. So uh, the value of the database, uh, of the workshop ID is the first thing in, the, in this um, code here. So you have to customize it to what your workshop ID is. You may create a few tests before you actually do the real one. So maybe the workshop ID may turn out to be number five. So you put in five as the workshop ID. The other thing you need to customize would be the author ID. And the author is the student who uploaded the submission, right? The person who created the submission is the author. And so, of course, every student has a different ID number. And so your IDs would be not five, which is what I put for mine, but the IDs of all the different students. Then you have the time that it was created. So what time should the submission be put in? They had a, let's say that the, the, the activity began on May 28th. So you would go and get the May 28th um, code for, I use Epoch Converter to get the, the timestamp, Epoch com to um, to get the the timestamp value Unix time code for the time that I want it to be. So I set the date to end time for when the submissions were supposed to be done uh, in my time zone, and then um, use that as the value for the time created. And then also the time modified should be the same thing, so that when the student who does the upload modifies the submission we have a new modified date come in. The title of the submission. So everybody is gonna put in a title for or subject line for their video, but what should it be when we have the defaults? You have to decide what that would be. In my situation, we decided on placeholder submission as the title. And then in the editor, the content 
block of the editor, if they were actually typing in content or inserting their video, there would be content there. So you have to put in some kind of placeholder text. So what should that be? This is also something that you would customize as well. So once you decide on that, those items that are highlighted in red, those are the customizable variables that you would use. Okay. So enough about that. Um, so once we created the submissions, here we have default submission for everybody. None of the students actually did this. This uh, appears for them automatically. So when they come into the workshop activity, all they need to do is click on their default submission and then upload their real um, video, and then it would change it. Okay. So here we have uh, all the students have a submission in there, and now it's time to allocate. Allocate means that you're giving, you're saying that student A is going to review student B, and student B is going to review student C. That is the allocation process. You can do it manually, where you can select specifically who is reviewing who. And you can also do it randomly. So you can say within this group, everybody should um, get two reviews or two submissions. Or if everybody's reviewing everybody, you can say this was a group of six. So you can say six. So you would say uh, six submissions for everybody. So everybody will review everybody else. So that can be done automatically in a random way. Or you can schedule an allocation. So as soon as somebody submits something, if you're not doing the default submission and you have students actually uploading something, as soon as somebody uploads, it gets allocated. So the scheduled allocation here tab has different um, settings that you can use. So you can explore them and see which one would fit your particular situation and then allocate your submissions. In this particular um, use case, the medical school actually wanted to allocate it manually. They had a particular student uh, uh, critiquing a specific student. So they knew who they wanted to allocate. I left it for them to use a drop down menu to choose um, the allocation. So they did that. But one thing that we found out quickly was that in the drop down menu, to choose somebody to be a reviewer, the non editing teachers were not showing up. So it means that the non editing teacher role did not have permission to um, review a student in the workshop activity. So I had to override the permission in order to do that, to let them do it, so that their names show up in the list. So here is our roadblock number two, cannot allocate submissions to the non-editing teacher role. So if you have non-editing teachers who need to assess, this is the way to overcome this challenge. You would go to that workshop and then click on permissions in the administration block, select non-editing teacher from the drop-down menu of roles. And then in this filter box here, you can type the word peer or peer assess, and it would bring up that capability, you can see right here. And you'd set that to allow, and then save your changes, and boom. Your non-editing teachers can now assess students in the workshop activity. So at this point, we have default submissions in the workshop and we have everybody allocated to everybody else and doing, you know, having the specific submissions that they're supposed to um, review. And at this point, it was a great uh, point to do my backup of the workshop activity. So before students begin to submit their true work, uh, I backed up the workshop activity and saved it so that we could use it again in the next phase for cardiovascular, pulmonary, and then of course next year when they begin to do um, workshops in, in the next year's activities, we will restore it into the new course. So now it's time to do, would you want to do that site-wide? Do what site-wide? I'm sorry. I missed the question at the time that you asked it. Editing teacher capability. No, no, you want to do it with the course. You can do it at the course level because you know that this, in this particular course, um, the, the non-editing teachers will need to be assessing students. So if you do it at the course level, then anytime you create any workshop activity, 
they have permission to assess. Um, or if it's only one workshop activity in particular that you have some, you know, that you want them to be able to do, then do it in the workshop. The solution I have for you here is directly in the workshop activity. So it is local only to the activity. If you do it site-wide, then it means that you expect that non-editing teachers all across your site within the whole institution should be able to um, assess students. It may not be the case. Okay, so if you... No, 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 no. I do not need to do it next year again. Um, the, the default submissions uh, work for the same, because it's the same class. So when they go into second year, it's the same students. If this is medical students. It's not, uh, they, they move together in blocks. So the same students are going to be together, taking the same classes from beginning all through to the end of their career in the school. Yeah, so uh, the same students and the same teachers as well. So the, the allocations and everything work perfectly. So we can use that. But if we have a new student, yeah, if you have new students, then we have to reinsert for new students. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so so we don't need, yeah, so we, we don't need to do it for uh, a brand new class. So uh, like I said, we're gonna do this across four years. So when this, this class moves to second year in September, there'll be a freshman, there'll be a new freshman class. There'll be first years doing it for the first time and they'll be new in the system. So when we restore the, um, the workshop, we will uh, use, we will not select user data, okay? If you know that when you're restoring an activity, you have those check boxes that you click. So you can say you, you don't want to use user data and then it will be empty. So there'll be no um, submissions in there. So that way you have the settings and things in there. They're using the same um, rubric. So it's already in there. They can They don't need to enter the rubric all over again, but we would need to redo insert, inserting of um, default submissions for these new students using their IDs. Yeah, and then um, and then we'd have to do a backup of their allocations once uh, we reach that phase so that theirs is also recorded and can be used to follow them up until their final year. Yeah, so lots of backups will be created um, for each class that comes in. Thank you. So in the submission phase, uh, this is when we finish setting up, everything is ready. So students who are up uploading their recordings can upload their work. And uh, once the submission phase closes, I have to deal with the latecomers. We all know, I hope you all know the um, Alice in Wonderland uh, white rabbit, always late to tea. So um, I have to deal with the latecomers now. So at the end of the submission phase, their uh, teachers will tell me, okay, I have one, two, three, four, five students who either forgot to hit submit or they were late in recording their um, videos and couldn't upload them. So could you please help get them to upload their work? Well, here is um, one gotcha. Even though you've checked off the box that late submissions are allowed, guess what? Because we inserted a submission for everybody, it considers that they have a submission already. So there's nowhere for them to click upload, you know? So it's it's uh, it's closed, even though submissions, late submissions are allowed. A submission has been made on their behalf through the database. And so it means the only way to help them to submit their work is to use the database again to insert their late work. So once again, I had to get, and this was just on, on an as need basis, not the whole class. So it wasn't that crazy. Uh, remember we had three phases of this. So the first time we did this activity, there were a lot of students who were late, about 10. So I had to do it for 10 individuals, but in the second, yeah, that would have been crazy. In the second um, iteration, um, of the activity, people, you know, students were like, oh, I know I have to be on time, otherwise I can't upload my work. And then in the final one, I had like just two people who were, were late, so that was easier. But I had to do it one by one. Log in as the student, find the user ID of that student, go to their My Media page, 
um, for Kaltura, find the video that they uploaded. If they forgot to publish it, then I have to publish it for them and then um, grab the video details um, as an HTML. So the, the Kaltura um, entry is an HTML entry. So you can just grab the HTML and then I go into the database, find that student submission, edit it, put in the content and then save. And so now their submission shows up in the in the workshop activity. So that was still a lot of background behind the curtain, Wizard of Oz kind of magic thing that I had to do so that their um, submission appears. It's There was no option of leaving behind a late student. Everybody had to be reviewed. Everybody needed the experience of being critiqued. Everybody needed the, the feedback on how they performed. And so leave no student behind. You had to get all the late ones in and then open the assessment phase so that everybody can critique um, their, their, their mates. So once again, this was the uh, process, get the user details and then create the HTML entry and update it in AdMiner. So now we're in the assessment phase. So the students can go in, assess their peers who did an upload. And then for those who are doing a live presentation um, in the classroom, they have their computers, they go to the feedback form and then they give their feedback. At the end of that phase, this is what it looks like when feedback is coming in. So this is me, let's say uh, I'll zoom in here. Okay, so let's say that This is me and this is my submission. And I can see people begin to um, review me. So here Karen has reviewed me and I got a total of 62 from her review. Janelle reviewed me and gave me perfect scores for everything. And so I got a hundred out of that. But I would like us to take a look at um, this review by Karen that gave me a grade of 62. So on the next screen, I will show you what that looks like. So this is the rubric. They were looking at the organization of the information that they presented. Um, they were looking at the complete, completeness of the, of the history and then how it's uh, communicated and all that. So these are the levels, right? And you can see the radio button is selected for um, this one over here and then here and so on. Let me go to the next screen, you'll see it easier. So this is what was selected. The, the red um, box outlines shows you what was selected. And in the rubric, they have entered the values 65 for this selection, 80, 90, and 100. Uh, zero is there. So they don't go logically from zero, one, two, three, or 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, it was just 65 eight, you know, and onward. What you expect is a straight average. So here you have 180, 80, and then 100. 80 plus 80 plus 100 divided by three gives me an average of 86.66. But guess what? Moodle is telling me that the average or the score is 62 out of 100. So I got a call at the end of the assessment phase and the department uh, curriculum educator is like, uh, the students are complaining that the grade doesn't make sense. What is it doing? Why is it a 62? It should be 86. So here we realized, oh, Moodle is calculating this a little differently. What is it doing? Huh, this is not a straight average. Oh my goodness. What do we do now? Okay, so let's figure out what Moodle is doing and then how do we overcome that challenge? So you saw those uh, rubric levels, 80, 100, you know, 80, 90, 100 and all that. Those numbers are actually translating to one, two, three, four, five and so on in, the, in, the, in Moodle. Whatever the formula is doing in the code, it is taking that as a one, two, three, four, five, no matter what you enter. So their level of 60 was actually a one. You know, they had a zero. So 65, that 60 was actually one. 70 is two, 80 is three, and so on and so forth. That's the first thing. Then 
the formula that it's actually using to con calculate these things, let's take an example that uh, a student got 80 for eye contact and 80 is actually a three. They got 90 for composure. They got 100 for volume, you know, the how loudly they were talking and then 100 for the content that they actually presented. Okay, so Moodle was actually taking these as three, four, five and five. Okay, here's the formula that Moodle is using. And this is actually available on the Moodle Docs for workshops. When you go to the workshop um, assessment phase and then you click Moodle Docs for this page at the bottom, it will take you to the calculation and you can see what it's doing. Um, it says that it's a sum of all the scores minus one divided by a sum of the number of different levels minus one. And in this example, that actually gives us the 80 is a three, right? So it's three minus one plus four minus one plus five minus one plus, I know it's doing something weird. It's not a bug. That is actually how they created it to compute. It's not a straight average. And that was like, oh my goodness, what do I do? Yeah, that is how it is actually created to, um, to compute because they don't want it. It's not a straight average. They're saying it's based on um, how others have critiqued the students. So if uh, within the group, five people are going to um, evaluate me and every three of them give me high scores and then two others give me low scores, it's using, it's comparing the assessments and then giving me some kind of mid, mid range there. It's, it's kind of odd. Yeah. But somebody would say, why are you using the workshop activity to do this if it's not giving you what you want and you have to jump through all these hoops? Well, we were in the middle of a semester when they came up with this uh, requirement and we don't do plugins, installing plugins um, in the middle of a semester. So I couldn't go put in a new plugin. Um, I have heard of uh, the Dataform plugin and I've also heard of, uh, in this, I would actually found out about the presentation um, plugin. So I may be looking at those so that we get them and try them out before September, get them in so that they're part of uh, our activities list. And then I can do training on it, create documentation so that people know about it. So midstream, mid semester, mid year, there was no way to put in new plugins. So we had to go with what we had. Okay. So yeah, you are expecting it to do, yeah, presentation, the presentation module. You should go check out that, um, presentation, uh, check out the recording. It was by Don Hinkleman. So check the schedule and then uh, go look for Don Hinkleman's presentation on the, yeah, presentation module. That's right, Hinkleman. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we expect is 80 plus 90 plus 100 plus 100 divided by four different criteria levels to give us 92.5. But Moodle is doing this weird thing and giving us 81.25 for the, for the score. So I had to manually calculate all those scores and then update the database with the true value that we want, the true average, because I can't go change the code. It's core code. I can't touch it anyway. Or create my own workshop module, um, Extraordinaire, that does... Uh, that does um, uh, averages, you know what I mean? So uh, we had to kind of do this superhero thing and make it work for them and it worked. So I want you to know that if you are restricted in terms of what you can do and you have to use the workshop module, you can solve these problems. So don't give up on it. So this is how I solved this uh, calculation problem. I had to create a report um, that looked at each assessment ID, each assessment for every student, and then look at their raw score. So the raw score that Moodle gave them, uh, 80, 90, 100, those raw scores are there. It's just that the formula does something else to them when it's given a final grade. So I catch it at that point, take 80, 90, 100, and then do a manual computation, which is sum of all these items divided by four. So I put in that in the um, query for the report, and then I get a, um, a nice report that has the assessment, the score, and then the new score. So once I did that, I, I downloaded the report into Excel, and then I use Excel to build my query. I found a really 
cute, cool way to do it because copying and pasting that in a text editor and then manually changing ID numbers and things like that and filling in uh, everything that's in front of it, uh, it was just a headache because if you look at all the assessments, there are 180 students each doing an assessment for six others. There were like 3,000 rows or something. I don't know. So using Excel to fill down the, the, the query was a real time saver. I click, 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 and then in minutes, my query is built. And so once I got that, then I put it into the um, ad miner, run the query, and then update the, the score in the database. So you all know Garmin or any GPS, you want to turn right and it says turn right and you find that there's a river there and then you find a different way to go. And so it says recalculating. So I had to do a lot of recalculating and um, got the final score to be what it was supposed to be. So once you update the database, uh, you come to the grading screen here. This is what the grading screen looks like. And it's because of this setting here. Let me show you. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see. This is what is making it not do a straight average, okay? Comparison of assessments. It's comparing assessments rather than giving you a straight average. Um, and the way that it's comparing the assessments, at first we found that the final score was also not an average. So once you play with these settings, very strict, strict, fair, by default it is fair, um, yeah, by default, it's fair. Um, so you have to select very lax for it to become a true average. Okay. So let's take a look at this final score over here. This score is supposed to be reflective of this 87 here that I'm pointing to is reflective of 100 plus 100 plus 62. All the different people who've reviewed me divided by the number of people who've reviewed me. That's my final score. So in order for this to be a true average, you needed to set this to very lax and then it becomes a true average. So that was simple enough to, to solve. So then you go to close the, the workshop activity and students can see their grades and scores. So let's take a look at some happy students. Here is um, the true averages, 90, These are true averages uh, and given a final score of 95. And if we take a look at one of the assessments here, it's what it's looked like. They selected these and the final score is computed correctly as 93 out of 100. Here's a, what it looks like when you have um, coffee gobble reports that have been created already. So they are there, whatever the department wanted, they can go and look at the assessment report for each of the activities. And the first one is a student facing report. The student can click on that and whoever it is can look at the assessments that they received in full. Okay. And this is what a report looks like. You have the name of the student, the type of presentation, whether it was an upload or whether it was a live presentation, they wanted to know that, who reviewed them, the values they selected in each criteria of the, of the rubric, the final score, and then the verbal feedback that was given. So this they can download. At the bottom of the report page, you have a download to Excel button, and now they have um, downloadable reports from the workshop activity. So this is what I've been doing. And the next phase here is for them to create portfolios. They want the student by the end of their fourth year to look at how they have grown in their experience of giving oral presentations so that when they finish and they go into residency and begin working as doctors, they've got it down pat how to do, you know, oral case presentations. So that's my next thing, how to figure out how to take all this information into a timeline kind of um, portfolio for students to see their development and progress over the years. So thank you for your attention. Any other questions, um, follow-ups? Thank you for all the back and forth in the, in the chat. That was uh, very um, helpful to direct us. Any other Hello. questions? Hello, it's Gareth from the IMO team. Thank you, Sarah. Just while the questions of caps coming into the chat. Once again, thank you not only from the IMO team, also myself, I really 
complete thorough so much to take in really can't work. and how the great so how you saw the problems and then found the solutions to overcome and even when or you were then constrained by other issues that were you know nothing you could do about plugins it was really really great thank you very much indeed you're welcome thank you